Hey everyone, welcome back to the program. Today, we're gonna do a little bit more beta flight by getting into the receivers tab. There really isn't a whole heck of a lot to set up under this tab, but I think there's a few things that we should take a look at, and there's also a couple of useful tools in there. Today, I'm using my trusty TBS Source 1. I've already got it plugged in, so what do you say? We click on that connect button, and we take a look. After connecting, I'm gonna go ahead and click on the receiver tab, and here we go. Let's start on the left-hand side here, and we'll work our way to the right, and we'll also work our way down as we go. So the first useful tool that we have is this graph right here. And well, what is this? This is the input that the flight controller is seeing from the receiver. This is what we're gonna use to essentially verify that everything is set up and configured correctly. Well, right now, everything's kind of sitting here somewhat dead. It's not giving us a lot of useful information. Well, and that's because we need to power the receiver and also have our radio on to be able to verify these things. And we're gonna do that. One thing that I always recommend whenever you're sitting at a bench, it is always a good idea to use a smoke stopper when you're plugging in a battery. We're gonna have to plug in the battery today in order to energize the receiver. So this is why I recommend the smoke stopper. Okay, with everything fired up, you're gonna see that my values here have changed. And normally you're looking for these bars to rest at, you know, about 1500 because that's the center of your stick. But really what these are gonna help you do is set your midpoints and your sub trims uh, to make sure that, well, you're not having any drift in your aircraft like I am here. My gimbals are shot. Um, I've run probably more than 2000 batteries through this radio over the last year plus. And so my numbers here are never going to be dead on center, but new gimbals, you know, freshly calibrated, you should have no problem getting all these numbers to rest at 1500, thus preventing this little bit of drift. But anyway, let's just continue and we'll look at all these different things. Um, again, so you can see the input here on my throttle, this is probably one of the easiest you know, wants to take a look at. As I move my throttle up and down, you'll see that essentially I'm going from a range from 1000 to 2000 throughout the throw of that stick. And as long as my channels are matching up here with my inputs on my radio, I know everything should be mapped correctly. And well, what I mean by mapping is this is actually the next thing we're gonna get into here is with the channel map. You'll see I have mine set at TAER1234. Uh, this was a very common way to set your channel map for Tyrannus about two or three years ago. I am seeing this a little different now, but what's important is you need to go into your system menu on your radio and see what this mapping is. Essentially, this needs to match in order to make sure that you're giving input to the correct channels. An example of that is like when I hit roll, if you look at the top bar, it's actually rolling the aircraft and it's not telling it to do something else. Um, now what's cool about Betaflight is they do have a few different built-in maps here. Um, so example, if you're on FR Sky, one of the newer setups, you'll see it's AETR1234. Uh, if that's the map that you're running because you have a newer radio, fine, no big deal. Just again, make sure this matches. I'm a little different and I'm running the Spectrum TAER just because I've been set up for such a long time. I've had this radio for uh, at least a year and a half now. I mean, I got this when these special editions first came out, so do the math. It might even be closer to two years. But essentially, that's what this is with the channel map and how it's going to reflect and change your inputs uh, when you move your sticks on the radio. Uh, and that's really what we use this graph for. Same thing uh, with your switches. So for an example, my arm switch is auxiliary one. If I want to verify that that's working, when I flip the switch, okay, well, the switch goes high and the aircraft should arm. Uh, auxiliary two, I used to use for flight modes. This isn't a switch I really use anymore. Um, so that's dead. We're not gonna get any input from that. Uh, but auxiliary three and four, I do use. Uh, one is for fail safe and the other is for turtle mode. So like auxiliary four, for example, this is my turtle mode. So this is just the first stage of turtle mode and second stage, they both literally do the same thing. Um, I just have different audio on my switch. Maybe you can hear it. Turtle power, turtle mode. Right? 
it's kind of cool. That's really the the only difference between the two modes for that. Uh, but I think you get the gist of this. This graph is really designed to show you what the flight controller is seeing for inputs from your transmitter. And if you've done everything correctly to this point, I remember when we talked about, you know, the ports and the configuration and setting all that up. If you've pulled that off, then this should work and you should get some input here on your graph. Then the only other trick is just making sure your, your channel map is right. That's the worst of it. That is the worst of this tab. Let's get the radio out of the way here. Uh, as we continue here, RSSI channel, most modern receivers are going to use an auxiliary channel for your RSSI value, your signal strength. And here I have mine defined as auxiliary 8. I have set that up in the Crossfire receiver, telling the Crossfire receiver itself to use this particular channel. And Crossfire is a little different. It's link quality, but same difference. Essentially, what's happening is we're still putting an RSSI value over an auxiliary channel. And that's what this does here. So whatever channel you've told your radio to output that RSSI on, this is what you're going to pick. And in this case, I'm just going to pick 8 because that's how it's set up. Uh, and what's neat is it's easy enough to figure this out because if you're right on top of the radio, it's usually a high auxiliary channel, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, they can be lower, but we're not going to get into that right now. Uh, essentially, though, you just look for whatever bar is penned at like 2,000, and that's usually your aux channel. Uh, of course, I'm running Crossfire, so you're not going to have the same effect. But if you move the radio away and you see a slight change in that, that's another good indicator of what your RSSI channel is. All right, let's get through this so this video isn't a million hours long like the rest of them. Uh, a few things here... Uh, stick low threshold, stick center, and stick high threshold. These are the values that the flight controller is expecting to see essentially at the low end of the stick, the middle of the stick, and the high end of the stick. The easiest way to look at this is think of your throttle value because, well, at throttle we're going to rest at a thousand. You want to have this val these values within that window a little bit. Essentially, you're going to have a small dead band on the end of the sticks. Uh, but we do want to tell it where the center is. Essentially, that means that the stick isn't going to respond until we hit an input of 1050. By the way, this value is defined, even though our range can go from 1000 to 2000. Again, it's going to max out at 1900 as well you know, not using the entire throw of that stick, but that's okay. These are literally beta flight defaults and there's probably no reason to change this. Uh, especially your stick center. We're going from a value from 1,000 to 2,000. 1,500 is our middle. There's really no reason to change that. I mean, maybe if you have some type of crazy radio setup, but all the standard stuff we're doing with, especially if you're using FR Sky, you really don't need to change any of this. Uh, as we go down, we have RC deadband and the yaw deadband. You don't really need to add anything to this. This essentially will, it'll give you a range that the flight controller will not respond to. Say example, you're really, really shaky in the center of the sticks. Well, by setting a deadband, your flight controller is going to ignore the very middle of that stick input. And if you're shaking all over the place, it's going to help smooth out the aircraft uh, pretty much because it's just not going to accept that input. Truthfully, I would recommend going to your rate, or I'm sorry, your pit tuning tab and adjusting your rates, specifically your expo, if that's a problem. But it is an option in here, um, but it's an option that a lot of people really aren't going to use. There is the 3D throttle deadband, and you know, this is something for advanced pilots. If you're trying to fly 3D, then you probably don't need my help. Um, I'm not going to really get into the whole explanation. Uh, then we have RC smoothing. This is a new feature in Betaflight, and it's something that I haven't played with. I don't see any real reason to make any changes here. Everything has been fine and dandy so far, all the quads that I've been running, and I haven't had any need to make a change here. Therefore, I haven't really researched exactly what these do, so I'm kind of just going to eliminate it and say it's not really something that we need. As we continue to the bottom, 
you can see we have a preview of the aircraft and this is going to show you how the aircraft is responding to the stick inputs so real quickly if i just give some movements here you can see if i give it yaw the aircraft spins you know i can pitch and i can roll and it's going to change the attitude of the aircraft it just gives us an idea of what the aircraft is anticipating doing based on your stick input and again this is something you're going to use to help set your stick centers uh your sub trim i think i'll do a video on setting up your trims and sub trims but that's going to be down the road and it's going to be more specific to a tyrannus radio because that's what i fly with and our final option down below you'll see we've got this moving graph and this is just showing again your stick inputs and how much input we're giving on those sticks for example, if I move my pitch severely, and I'm going to hold it there for a little bit. Of course, because my sticks are pretty yonky, I'm getting a little roll in it as well. I think that's good. We'll let it go. And as our graph moves, we'll, you'll see how I did an extreme pitch forward, and I kind of moved the roll a little bit by accident. But as soon as I let that stick go, how it's coming right back to the center. Again, this is just a tool you can use to see if you're actually getting end-to-end -end, uh, with the stick input uh, to make sure the flight controller is seeing what you're expecting it to see. Well, thanks again to the handy TBS Source 1 for being our buddy and helping us getting through this beta flight video today. But that's all I got for this one. Hopefully it's going to help you understand the receiver tab just a little bit better. But it's time for me to get out of here. If you can, check out my sponsor, Hot Dog FPV best sponsor in the world. Maybe buy yourself something nice. I can almost guarantee you won't be disappointed. But that's it. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.